And that was only after about a year of concerted effort on my part, where I would buy myself flowers. <laughs> I would thank him for them. Oh, wait, it took a year of bath for him to get the hint? Oh yes. my gosh. Why are, why is your show like Love oblivious? Ah, yes, yes. You're, you're sending yourself flowers. What? Okay, cool. That's why I had to start thinking. And thanking him. Yeah. Yeah. No comment. Like. And then, I, the first couple times I did it, he was like, <laughs> and I'm like, I bought them for myself with your money. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it, there it just works. Sorry. That is so funny. <laughs> no, the the flower is actually because in order to talk about everything we're going to talk about, we can only half an hour. Um, I like to give a little example of the idea of what something is. Did you all watch the Father Mike Schmidt talk where he talks about the isness of the chair? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't need to do that whole thing. But when you have something like a flower, right? Like he says about the chair, there is a purpose for the flower. The flower has been created as what it is. If I decide that this flower is a baseball bat and I decide to hit things with it, or if I decide, <laughs> If I decide that the flower right, is an axe and I decide that I'm going to chop this down, well, eventually, <laughs> eventually the flower breaks. And I like that example. I like that example because we're talking today about femininity, we're talking about that it needs to be a woman. And femininity, who you are as a young woman, has its own isness. And when that femininity, when who you are isn't respected, isn't acknowledged, isn't lived, you break. So we're gonna come back to the flower. But first we have to talk about mad cow disease. <laughs> yes. Because what we're discussing today has its roots in natural law, and it has its roots in the way God ordered things. God is a God of order. Everything that he created has its own order in creation. That's why when we say something is disordered, it's very literal. It means it's out of order, out of sync, out of how God made it. Now, way back when mad cow disease was like a thing, and everybody was super freaked out about beef and couldn't go to Burger King because Burger King was like, no, we don't buy our beef from England. They discovered that what made cows literally go insane, that's why it was called mad cow disease, because it was British, and in, you know, in jolly old England, if something's mad, it means it's crazy. So the cows literally went crazy because they were being fed food that had ground up cow in it. So the cows were basically cannibalized by their feed. Now cows are not meat eaters. Cows are herbivores. They were created to eat plants. So when they were cannibalized, that was a disorder. It was out of the natural law. It was out of how God created cows, and they literally went crazy. And I like to use that example for what happens when something becomes disordered, when something is out of the order God created it to be. So now we've got our broken flower, and we've got mad cow disease, that means we can talk about what it means to be a woman. <laughs> uh, <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> she knows. I, we had this talk in our family. We talk about the mad cow disease. We do this. So she's like, oh, I know where this is going. Women, as women, we are created in God's order to be known, to be loved, to be fruitful, and to be pursued. Known, loved, fruitful, pursued. And that's what we're going to talk about. And so, if we want to talk about what it means to be known, we can say, as women, we want to be understood for who we are, for how we are. And when we don't feel understood, when we don't feel seen, it hurts. And it can hurt over and over again until we end up like our broken flower. 
You see, deep inside each of us, there is this desire given to us by God to be seen the way he sees us, to be loved the way he loves us. But what does it mean to really be loved? John Paul II tells us that we are created, human beings are created to be objects of love, not objects of use. You see, when I use the flower, not as a flower, it broke. If you are used, you are not being loved. And there is a virtue that protects us from use. The virtue that protects us from being used instead of loved is chastity. Here we go. Right? This is the part where I tune you out. Because my whole life as a young Catholic, all I've heard about is chastity. And all I've heard about is what I should and shouldn't wear. And wait till you're married. And it's boring. And I've heard it all so many times. Right? Chastity is probably one of the most misunderstood virtues because we tend to equate it with the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. After all the things you're not supposed to do, you're going to be happy because happiness is negative, right? It's actually the very opposite. John Paul II actually says chastity is the sure way to happiness because as a virtue, it's not primarily external. It's internal. It's inside. And it's designed to protect our hearts. It's designed to protect our minds, and it protects our bodies. If our idea of chastity is only what we wear, or how we're acting on the outside, we got it all wrong. And sometimes we also tend to equate chastity with celibacy, right? Oh, I only have to be chaste until I'm married. Flesh. Chastity is a lifelong thing. It's actually something you practice every day, whether you're married, whether you're a priest, whether you're a sister, whether you're single. And that's just another aspect of chastity that we, we tend to get wrong because, again, chastity protects us. Chastity ensures that we are loved. And it's possible for a husband and a wife to use each other. It's possible for them to not act in a chaste way towards one another, which means an unloving way towards one another, and to instead see each other as objects of use. See, chastity guards you from selfishness. When we are chaste, we have an internal attitude that says, I know who I am in the eyes of God, and I'm going to act like I know who I am. It means I know I deserve to be respected. It means I know I deserve not to be used by someone, but instead to be loved and honored. And when we develop this internal attitude, it automatically reflects itself externally. Because if I truly believe that I deserve to be loved, if I truly believe that I have this dignity that's worth protecting, well then guess what? I'm not going to act in a way that doesn't reflect inner attitude. So chastity is the virtue that protects love. It allows us to love. It keeps us from being broken like the flower. But chastity also means we learn how to set boundaries. If we want to love, if we want to be loved, then we have to understand that we deserve to have boundaries in our relationships boundaries in our families, boundaries with how we interact with people, on any level of relationship with them. Boundaries, setting boundaries, emotional boundaries, and physical boundaries, are protection for the virtue of chastity. And we kind of, we have this idea, especially in our culture, right, because of social media, and it's so easy to make friends, and it's so easy to interact. Right? So we think like, oh yeah, I can just be best friends with a guy. Right? My best friend is a guy. All my best friends are guys. Guess what? Guys don't understand the friend zone. They don't. They say they do. 
But a guy's understanding of the friend zone is, well, it just means she just wants to be friends right now. I still have a chance. That might change. I might get her to change her mind. Friend zone does not compute. And that's okay. Because men, as we will talk about in a little bit, are created to pursue. So they are hardwired to not grasp the idea of a friend zone. We get it. It makes perfect sense to us. But it makes no sense to them. So understanding that on our part can help us set healthy boundaries in our friendships with guys. And that's for our own protection, right? So they don't misunderstand what our intentions are, and they will. But also, it protects them. It's respectful to them. If you know that friend zone is not going to completely compute, well, then that helps you decide what kind of boundary you have to set in your friendships with other, with other guys. It's definitely possible to have friends who are guys. Impossible to do it without boundaries that you enforce. So we are made to be known, loved, fruitful, and pursued. Chastity will help us guard ourselves so that we can be loved and so we can love. But what about being fruitful? What does being fruitful mean? As a woman, you have these, these things we call feminine abilities. They're feminine superpowers. They're also known as the shuns. That's my least favorite term for them. But these feminine abilities are menstruation. Ooh, she said menstruation. This is a sash <laughs> Ovulation, ovulation, gestation, lactation. The biological reality of your bodies as young women tells us something about who we are and how we are to relate to other people. Your entire being as a woman is designed to be fruitful, to create life, to sustain life, to protect life, to birth life, and then to sustain it again. That's your essence as a female. That biological reality informs how you are to interact with everybody that you meet. And it happens on a subconscious level, it happens on an interior level, and then it also happens on a very conscious level. See, we are made to be fruitful. You are made to be fruitful physically, but also spiritually and emotionally. You know, a, a nun in a convent is never going to have a biological child. She's never going to actually gestate or lactate, even though that's her feminine ability. But it doesn't mean that she can't mother. It doesn't mean that she can't be fruitful. Because again, that biological reality has a spiritual and an emotional component to it. So if we are made that way, right? We are made to be life bearers. We are made to be life givers. This interpersonal reality, this natural law, right? There we go. There, we're bringing in the mad cow disease. But you never thought I would put gestation, mad cow disease, and breastfeeding all in the same sentence. <laughs> but we just did it. Right? The reality of how you're created, the natural order of human femininity, is to be like You know, JP2, I quote him a lot. Um, yes. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> but I'm not fixing it. <laughs> he said that women have a feminine genius about them. And that part of this genius is that humanity is entrusted to women in a unique and special way. That's really cool. He didn't say that about me. Humanity is interested to women in a unique and special way. You know, if our, if our biological realities tell us how we interact spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically with other people, they tell us something important about what JP2 just said, humanity being entrusted to us. There was this study, and um, it was done with little children. And 
and children were separated into boys and girls. And they were given a pile of blocks. And they were just told to play. And then these psychologists and, and psychiatrists observed them because they wanted to see the difference in play between boys and girls. And something very fascinating happened. These little kids, if they were the boys, the boys took the blocks and they built towers. And they tried to build the towers as high as they could. Then they'd knock them down and they'd build them all over again. And then it was my tower is taller than your tower. My tower is bigger than your tower. This is what they did. This is how the boys played. The girls took the blocks and they built houses. They built enclosures. They built rooms in the enclosures. They made blocks be people and they put the people in the enclosures. And then they started inviting other people, the little block people from this person to come visit them in this little block house. And this little block house went to go visit that little block house. What's fascinating about this is that these kids, on a, not consciously, were enacting a biological reality in their play. And keeping it PG, if I can, <laughs> when we think of our bodies and how we are created, our reality, our life-giving reality, right, our ability to menstruate, ovulate, gestate, and lactate, it's all internal. It's all interior, right? Our womb, where all of that except lactation takes place, is inside. Men are very external. They built towers. They wanted to see whose tower was bigger. They wanted to initiate, right? Initiate, they went out, built the big tower knocked down and built a bigger tower. Their experience of play not only mirrored their biological reality of how they are life-giving physically, but it, it was outside. The little girls, they made rooms. They made enclosures. They made a place where they welcomed people. In our family, Chris and I call that wombing. You can laugh, it's weird. <laughs> but we listened to this, this talk that explained this study and how it related to our physical realities and then how those physical realities, the way we are made, the story our bodies tell, how we relate to others. And the point that the man giving the talk um, made was that women over and over again they want to gather, they want to include, right? And he equated that to the reality of us having a womb, where we literally house life, protect life, invite life. And so we started referring to that, that thing that I do, as wombing. You know, one year we had on Thanksgiving, you know, Chris used to be in the Marine Corps. And because of that, when Thanksgiving would come up and we lived on a military base, there would be some guys who didn't get to go home for Thanksgiving. And that made me sad. So I would invite them over. <laughs> a lot of them. Because <laughs> we couldn't leave anybody out. And sometimes I would forget to tell him. And, um, and so it would be, you know, Thanksgiving would be coming and we'd be doing our Thanksgiving food shopping and I'd be like, okay, well we need like three turkeys. And he, uh, what? <laughs> you know, we need to get a bunch of turkeys. Why? <laughs> well, because, you know, so and 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 so's girlfriend are all coming over. Like, what? Because <laughs> they, they didn't have anywhere else to go. That's so sad. We had to invite them. <laughs> and he'd be like, you're doing it again. What? What am I doing? The wombing thing. <laughs> and that's how that got started. <laughs> but you know what? He, he had a point. Because Humanity being entrusted to us as women disposes us towards seeing the needs of other people in a way that men don't see it. And that's okay, that's good, it's part of your genius as young women. This entrustment of humanity to you as a woman. 
It's different than the way God entrusted humanity to men. Men are made to be protectors. They are made to go out. They're made to turn those, those towers that they built out of blocks. You know, at one point it was into swords to protect their families. At another point, it was physical strength. They're made to be protectors of humanity. We are made to see the individual, the needs of humanity, and to want to meet those needs. So that's how we are fruitful. We are made to be known, we're made to be loved, we're made to be fruitful. We're also made to be pursued. And that can sound kind of weird, right? Especially when we've been told over and over again how empowered we are as women, right? There was a, a movement oh, that started back in the 60s, you know, the, the feminist movement that said we don't need men, we are better than men, we can do everything men can do. That might be true to an extent, but we are different than that. And you know what? We do need men, and men need women. God didn't put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden for each other just because he was bored. He did it because we are made to live in complementarity to one another. We have strengths. We have this feminine genius that men do not have. They have their own, they have their own strengths that we don't. And one of the ways we as women are ordered is that we are made to be pursued. And that can make it sound kind of boring, like, really? Laura, have you seen the guys out there? They don't pursue. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, if I want to be married someday, I gotta do something, because not only do they not understand the friend zone, they don't even understand when I want to let them out of it. <laughs> <laughs> the song tells us, uh, there's a song, and it says, as a bride waits, waits for her groom, so I wait on the Lord. And that song is a really nice key into what God was thinking when he created women in his order as the one who is pursued by the man. And he did it for a reason, because everything God does, he has a reason for. And everything he ordered on earth tells us something about a heavenly reality. Our experience as women, the way we are made to be pursued by a man, tells us how God wants to pursue us as his people. And that's kind of beautiful. You know, we talk a lot about how we need to be praying more and we need to do this, and it makes it sound like we need to always be pursuing God. But did you ever stop to think, God, who loves you so, so much, pursues you? Because he does. And he gave us this clue about the, the fact that he pursues us in the way he ordered our experiences as men. But there's a catch here. Because of so many of our own life experiences, whether it's with families, whether it's with friends, whether it's with boyfriends, we don't know how to be pursued. And if we've been wounded, if we've been used, if we could be and we're like this broken flower, the idea of being pursued, even by God, is scary. But we will never, we will never be able to have a rightly ordered relationship, a rightly ordered marriage, if we don't first learn how to let God pursue us. Because we'll never be able to allow a good man And so, if you feel called to marriage, if you feel called to religious life, the first thing you have to do for the sake of that vocation is, Jesus, I have no idea what it means for you to pursue me, but I need you to teach me. I need you to show me. Mary, Jesus isn't my favorite right now, so I'm going to talk to you because you're his mom. 
<laughs> I need you to teach me how to let him pursue me. She was the expert at it. I mean, he pursued her so faithfully, he sent an angel to ask for her consent to make her the mother of God. God is absolutely capable of pursuing you. We're the ones who don't let him. So start there. For the sake of that relationship you desperately want. For the sake of the marriage you want to have someday. For the sake of the order you want to join to be a sister. Start with Jesus. Mary. Show me how you can her. Because then and only then will that good man, and there are some out there, Only then will he be able to do what he was created to do, which is pursue. You know something that is so demoralizing to men is when they don't get to be men. Mm -hmm. So when we, because we're broken, because we're scared, because we're just so darn sick of waiting already, right? Get your act together. You're not in the friend zone anymore. Come on, right? We get so sick of that. So we pursue. And it has the exact opposite effect. Mm -hmm. Because that good man, who is learning how to be a man, it emasculates him. Even in marriage, right? If I step into the role that's designed and ordered by God for Chris, that hurts him. That wounds him. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be passive, right? Okay, well, just like the psalmist said, I'm going to swoon on my bed all day long. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> Come on, already. Show up. Right? That would be really lame and super boring. And you have this feminine genius that you need to live in the world. You know, the scriptures have these great example of some women who per allowed themselves to be pursued, but who did it in a uniquely feminine way. How many of you have seen the movie Big Fat Greek Wedding? <laughs> okay, my favorite line in that movie is, the man is the head of the family, but the wife is the neck, and she can turn the head any way she wants. <laughs> <laughs> we don't tell Chris that I said that. <laughs> but you know, I love that line because it sums up the feminine, very feminine ability to see a situation, to know what has to be done, and then to encourage it along. It's similar to the wedding at Cana, when Mary saw that these people, they were out of the good wine, they were like super embarrassed. What are we gonna do? We have all these guests. Wine was like a huge deal at weddings back in those days, and probably small well, still is now. But they didn't have whiskey, so <laughs> Right, so they ran out of the wine, and they're embarrassed. And Jesus, he might have been God, but he was also a man. So he was out hanging with his friends. And you know, they're lounging around eating snacks. Mary's like, she sees it. The entrustment of the human person, right, to women. So she goes to Jesus. Hey, you're out of wine. You need to do something. And so Mary didn't nag him. Mary didn't, you know, work her own miracle. Mary didn't, Jesus, no, really. Jesus, <laughs> right? She didn't cop the mom voice. Instead, she did what women do, an arranged situation. So what had to happen, happened. She went up to the servants, and she's like, hey, that guy over there lounging with his friends, ignoring me. Do whatever he tells you. <laughs> and so then they go up. They must have been so relieved, right? Like, oh, God, somebody's going to do something. This is awful. I'm going to get fired. I didn't get enough wine. And then Jesus worked his first public miracle. The rest is history. And that bride and groom whew, had the best party ever. <laughs> With, like, the best wine ever. That was a very feminine way for Mary. You know, there's a story of Ruth in the Bible. 
good. She was waiting on Boaz. Boaz was not in the time frame. Boaz was available. He was a good man. And he was just not getting it. <laughs> so Ruth had two options, right? She could have been like, okay, I'm going to Snapchat him every hour until he tells me I'm beautiful. And then I'm going to totally stalk him on social media until he asks me out. And then I'm going to ask him to come to my family party. And then I'm going to ask him to come over. And then I'm going to make him dinner. And then I'm going to have him. She didn't do that. She didn't pursue. Instead, she very meekly got his attention. She was a little bit dramatic about it and slept at his feet. Again, she saw, right? This man's good for me. I know he likes me. I don't know, maybe he was like super shy, or maybe he was just really dense. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but in her feminine way, using that feminine genius, wow, she got his attention. Esther, Queen Esther was the same. She literally used her femininity to save the entire Jewish people. She wasn't too thrilled about the fact that the king wanted to marry her. Two minutes. And, and so she married him. She knew that this was God's calling on her life. She knew deep down the king was a good guy. But he kind of sort of wanted to kill the people. So she, being the good neck, right, can turn the head at any time she wants. She didn't summon his troops and tell them, don't listen to the king. She didn't usurp his authority. She didn't disrespect him. She didn't throw a temper tantrum. She didn't get super passive aggressive and lock herself up in her fancy chambers. <laughs> what did she do? She dressed up in her fanciest clothes, made herself look drop dead gorgeous. Told the servants, we're gonna have a big party in honor of my husband. And then she went to him all decked out Hey. <laughs> and she compliments him. She throws this party in his honor. He feels great. All the people are fed. All the people are happy. And she's like, by the way, don't kill me. And he, because he felt so honored by her and so respected by her, she didn't usurp his authority. Right? She enhanced her femininity and her femininity. In that, you deserve, you are made, you are ordered to be known, to be loved, not to be broken or over, right? to be known, to be loved. 